Hello everyone, today we talk about Gothic Longobard and Frankish Law in Italy. We introduced this topic for our series of on medieval law, fundamentally, but it's a theme that we have discussed at times, both during the same series, but also during Longobard history, that I, that I created a, a playlist on. And uh, I don't remember which specific video we actually talked about uh, the Edict of Rotary and its great importance for, you know, Germanistic, for uh, history of law, uh, as it's one of the, uh, it's basically the closest uh, that we have in, in time and in, in, uh, in the originality of the juridical institutions to German law. You know, there is an enormous debate about it that's technically I don't know if we whether we we will even ever talk about in um, this medieval law series because it's complicated philologically speaking and it requires also more competence in juridical uh, you know in history of, of law than, than I have I studied these things just I think once during uh, no actually twice because I had uh, you know, as you know, I, I wrote something about Longobards myself, uh, but it wasn't specifically concentrated, at least, on Rotary's Edict. And today we introduce, generally, the, the broader picture in this land that sees, as, as the, the title says, of course, the succession of these Germanic dominations, which mm, were mm, very important, eventually, for the future of the Italic Kingdom, that is properly created uh, in these times also as a you know a, an independent political institution for the recovery of Roman law. We have seen it in in the, in the videos about the the revival of Roman law by the Bolognese school, eventually its expansion Europe wide. So it's a very interesting aspect. Today we talk about the Germanic side of the story that is deeply overlooked. Uh, because mostly we say, okay, well, we should rather study about the Byzantine side of the eye. It was always there in Italy during the, uh, you know, up, uh, even after the Longobard migrations and afterwards under the, the, the Carolingian period and beyond. So that the Justinian code eventually survived in these areas in part, where at least there was a Roman law that uh, was still enforced in the Byzantine held territories. Now the question is rather, today we will not address it properly, but I mean the fact that mm, the revival of Roman law by the Bolognese school fundamentally emerges from Longobardist and Frankist, uh, if, if we can uh, call them this way, that is to say, local lawyers that fundamentally were expert as normal lawyers in the local uh, laws of the kingdom that were not Roman. Right, they were Germanic. They were uh, a mix, fundamentally, of mo mostly Longobard and Frankish laws. There was some interesting relic from the broader Gothic uh, world because there were, there were influences even from Visigothic Spain. We will see partly today, but more naturally also the Edictum Theodorici that we will see now, dated back to Ostrogothic times, and naturally also the feudal law. Right, so what had been issued also by the the emperors after the after the the Frankish uh, conquest and uh, the plurality that had it that by the time in the eleventh century the, all these juridical systems had been blended together and something very organic and very complex that you don't find in fact in other parts of Europe and this is why this is so important and and it's functional eventually to recover Roman law because the Roman law was taken back at that time to discipline those um, aspects that had remained um, to side sometimes, you know, even to, to fill the gaps properly the Germanic laws, but, you know, to say, okay, well, we have something more complex in a way, we can give it a look and depending on the situation, um, referring to it to, to, to fix also the uh, the current laws in because of the times that were changing fundamentally because of the enormous uh, growth of economical complexity and exchanges and old contracts and things like this so this is part of the reason that we have explained also in the dedicated video today we see mostly how the uh, 
the Italic Kingdom was properly created under the Longobards in um in in a truly institutional sense, on a Germanic base, right? In 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 Ostrogothic Italy, we don't have the same thing. There is technically you know a Regnum Italia, but it's uh, fundamentally still conceived under the the influence, if anything, the, the, namely the control of Constantinople. And the Ostrogoths do not uh, properly enforce their own uh, their own law. Uh, they, uh, the, there is a hybrid that we'll see it will emerge as in other Romano-Germanic kingdoms, especially in the, um, in, in the Mediterranean, we're talking chiefly about the Goths and the Burgundians, that fundamentally had a very Romanized Germanic law that at some point became the common law for, for all people, right, Romans and Germans alike. Also because, and here we're talking about this specifically because the ethnic discriminant at this point is merely juridical. Right, there is no other way to discriminate someone saying, okay, well, you know, what is this for? It, this is properly for saying, you know, what kind of um, a legal system uh, of reference do you apply to? Right, and, and that's what will eventually uh, will relate to also publicly to the institutions and to, to justice and so on. So these are actually very complex topics. There is also a, a great debate about certain aspects of them. Um, but it's important to realize that eventually the Longobard migration into Italy will change uh, a lot, right? A lot, not just for European history as a whole, but properly for... Mm, in this Italy is very similar to, to Britain, right? Well, whereas Gaul and, and, um, and Spain have a bit similar histories, also if they, they were, even in their situation it's pretty complex, telling the truth. Um, because we have properly the Germanization, the cultural juridical Germanization of the populations, right? And in this area were overwhelmingly, uh, I mean, they were Romans. Let's be honest, they were Romans, they were Catholic, but this does not prevent at all the mere Germanization um, at all levels of society. Uh, this is very well known. The very well known. Mm, topic to anybody who is acquainted to, to Longbird history, which unfortunately is like uncomprehensibly overlooked. It's possibly the most important actually af after the Frankish one in Ger Germanic history in uh, early medieval Europe. And um, it presents this important juridical homogeneity that makes us understand better, and that's why it's the uh, Rotary's edict is so important for Germanistic, but also the original Germanic law was about. In a world that wasn't so different uh, in, you know, in, in certain ways at least from, of course it was different from the original one, but you know, if you take for example Frankish Gaul, we have a, a very different reality from the one the Franks had uh, migrated into back in the day from next door Germany, because objectively the two worlds were very different. The Longobards really have, as you know, a you know, a, a most evident uh, Nordic background that is sometimes mitigated, in my opinion, relativistically speaking, because we have no other hint to show us that it was otherwise, actually, um, that is injected in basically the heart of, of, of Roman Europe, right? They, these guys are the last to settle into Italy and create properly a kingdom on their own. The, the, the Longobards are not framed under any anybody's... Um, Tutelage, they they are there. They they do not compromise with the Roman Empire. They do not feel that they are there because they have received legitimization from them. Um, even if there was some negotiation about their their invasion, that it seems actually was guided by the same Byzantines, contrarily to the ideas. But there are many myths, and and that are um, unfortunately very widespread for those at least who know uh, who think to know something about out there about the Longobards, also about this brutal, barbaric, th that's just historiographical cliches, that has nothing to do with the factual historical reality we have in front of our eyes at all levels of society, including for the fact that uh, objectively uh, by the late 7th century and the basically the disintegration of Merovingian power, Longobard Italy was the most unitary and compact and uh, civilly working 
Romano-Germanic kingdom out there. Um, it had a pretty damn good public administration. Uh, and the Longobards achieved, objectively, an enormous deal uh, uh, under a juridical and administrative point of view, so much that they, they were far ahead to, to, to the Franks, and so, many, so, so much that when Charlemagne conquers uh, the Longobard kingdom, not only the Longobard kingdom uh, remains as such, because Charlemagne, differently from other lands, becomes king of the Longobards, right? It's not that he became kings of the, the Alamanni or the... No, the, the Longobards were actually very admired by the Franks, because these the, the latter recognized objectively the fact that, that, that those were Germans had not compromised themselves at any level culturally speaking and they and they admired them a lot um, and not only but they they strive in Carolingian Italy to maintain functional the Longobard administrative system that naturally worked on the base of the edict of of the uh, we we call it Rotary's edict because Rotary was the first Longobard king to properly, uh, not to issue laws, but, you know, to put them in freedom forms and to, you know, to, with this bulky reality, you know, it's very interesting to read. Uh, it's naturally in Latin, and it has, um, it, it really, it's a, it's an eye-opener about, about those worlds. Uh, there are beautiful studies by Monzelewski, by, you know, it, it's, uh, I like, you know, it's possibly the single most important piece of, of Germanic law we have. Um, for for those times at least, and you know, by the the, the sheer importance of those places, just the the most relevant in in, in absolute terms, and of course, uh, it remains in a way the properly the the law of the land, right? Uh, everybody was a Longobard at the time. We will touch now briefly the relation with the Romans, juridically speaking, which is also, uh, you know, often depicted like a horror story of, of oppression and support. There is no sheer proof of anything like this. The only way I will also explain why, which are already done often in Longobard history videos, that, the, you know, 19th century uh, national historiographers and even people who objectively had also kind of a better intellect, you know, more honest intellectual background, uh, when setting Longobard Italy, they didn't find the Romans in the documents. They said, what the hell are these guys? So it was invented that, you know, the Romans had been allegedly repressed. We're talking about the Longobards being like from 1 to 3% of the whole Italian population when they marched in. So already just to give you the sheer size of this, this reality. Yes, Italy was raised to the ground by the Gothic War, but was still for example, the, the richest uh, land per capita in the world out, out there. Um, there was a reality that, of course, could not work in any way in a oppressive, elitistic uh, marginalization of the Roman populace. This was overwhelmingly um, uh, larger, uh, but also overwhelmingly more skilled and you know and trained, civilly speaking, and Generally speaking, also in in a, in a urban reality, L like in unlike any other land in in uh, in Europe at that point. So um, I it's important to also realize this dichotomy. Yes, uh, Italy gets this strong fracture from the Gothic War, which is really terrifying. There is there there is the devastation, there is the plague, and so on. But there is no comparison sometimes with other lands, and this is exactly what favors the Germanization. That is to say, in a few generations, everybody starts being de facto, juridically, a Longobard, right? They, they, there is nobody that, you know, the, if there was a servant back in the day, it was considered as such because it was the subjected population. We, we realize that in a few generations this ended. They became all homogeneously longward. We have lots of Romans from the Byzantine held areas that literally flee. Uh, the bishops are despaired into Longobard land because they want to leave there because the ways, there's way less fiscal pressure than the one the Byzantines exercise. What has become now a peripheral land of the empire that will, in fact, will also autonomize itself in its um, Byzantine administration quite soon, um, in a way. Um, and and this is properly the, the reality we have, is that uh, the Romans reappear mostly in the late uh, Longobard period when when the uh, Longobard kingdom will be able to conquer Ravenna, the center of the Exarchate. So it will start in the sand, basically. Before the Norman conquest, the Longobards had basically extended their control almost throughout the, the whole peninsula. Right? It just Rome basically held out. Um, but... Uh, the, the that brought to the injection 
by the late 8th century of, new, of people that were properly Roman because they had always lived in the Byzantine lands that, that were often also merchants, people with a certain dynamic you know, background that, that are in, were important for the Longobard kingdom. The, the Longobards care very much about Ravenna, especially also to stress the fact that finally, you know, after a couple of centuries, they managed to take that away from the Byzantines and so on, as the main administrative center uh, in the peninsula and so on. Um, and they, they start issuing also, you know, when Heistel, for example, starts ruling from there, starts issuing uh, Roman coins, for example, that celebrate not the fact that the, Ro the Longobards were kind of Romanizing, but that the Longobards were now protecting the Roman subjects and so on. So it's a very fascinating story that I had the opportunity to study some, some year ago now too many years ago at this point, uh, that we can discuss, because I have a lot of you, I don't know, because either because you're Italian or you're interested simply in the period, which is objectively very fascinating, that you're curious about this, and these are objectively things you don't hear much around, right? The, the, there isn't, like, a international um, interest or, or, or understanding or care about this because there is no perspective mostly about early medieval history and often these topics are treated in a in, in extremely superficial ways uh, most people are essentially polarized around dynamics that are mostly not even central european it was also po possibly in fact the most dynamic at some levels but probably northern europeans that are do not apply at all to a Mediterranean context, for example. Um, so uh, th there is, unfortunately, a lot of disorientation in these topics, and it sounds as if you know I have my own opinion, but no, there is an entire historiography that now has pretty much uh, demonstrated all this without any hope to you know to flip it <laughs> right like back in the day was done. And, and unfortunately, the older narrative has somewhat remained. Why? Because people repeat just what they they hear uh, without knowing, without studying, without even realizing that that there are people that live and study this stuff and that it's they they are in the western reality you can read uh publications the the result of you know think about the anglo-saxon think about wickham for example just studied a lot um not just early medieval europe as a whole but specifically Italy has written a lot of interesting stuff about uh, the long word and wickham is easily if not the greatest but the, the one of the greatest names of early medieval of early medievalists that exist in the world this time also a pretty famous figure um and also a nice person unfortunately i i didn't i never met him but uh i i would like to i think i could have some chance to do it and i could even ask him something if you're interested you can uh we could exploit the thing um and this is the picture we have that uh as we were saying, the, long, uh, the, the Franks tried to, with the uh, Carolingian times, the Carolingian kingdom of Italy was technically the most important, not just because of this um, political and institutional continuity with the Longobard kingdom. It was, a, as we've seen, this pretty useful thing, and after all, we know that also in the history of the Holy Roman Empire, what the Germans tried to do, uh, and they really tried hard, and uh, that's, that's admired, and, and, and it was a very intelligent thing to do. Uh, unlike even their 19th century nationalistic uh, historiography wanted to, to, to pretend to, to tell, to centralize into Italy. Where is that the, the, the Carolingians want to start ruling from? What is that the Ottonians want to start ruling Of course, Rome. Wh wh where else? What kind of Roman emperor doesn't rule from Rome? Right, and and it was obvious. These were rich lands; they were populated. They had this, they were very well placed in the Mediterranean. Had a lot of context. They 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 had this dramatic, uh, bureaucratic administrative skills that were emerging. I mean, bureaucratic maybe is a big word, but you know, for for those time standards, that's exactly where in the West, in Latin Germanic Europe, where we would like to find it there. Um, so they they tried their best. Um, Carolingian uh, Italy is also a topic rarely hear about and um, it's it's really interesting I mean it's a bit the history of a decadence broadly meant because of course they can't keep it together at some point but the the crucial point was of course Rome once again and the papacy and the imperial crowning because without that you went nowhere since Louis de Pius was basically sanctioned that as it will remain for for centuries and centuries to come that if you wanted to be emperor you had to go to Rome to be crowned, otherwise there was no way to do it. Uh, and 
this naturally pertains to the broader papal imperial relations uh, but it's it's something so clear in the mind of someone that was still gravitating around the roman world is broadly meant in the early middle ages that was exactly what you know up to the british isles everybody was literally obsessed uh, with in terms of power and legitimization and authority well we have to enter into this realization that um that there is no no other mm, point of reference objectively in terms also of a constructive civilized uh, direction at this point uh, especially in early medieval times then um, we could uh, talk about so the Franks naturally start making their own law when they come right there the the capitularies they start issuing laws that basically corrected either something that was happening there of course the Frankish conquest brought caused a bit of a mess in, into uh, Italian society as a whole because it was first of all a war of conquest it wasn't so harsh like in other lands also because uh, these lands were difficult to control so it was not like you could simply exterminate everybody and also what what you could gain from it so there was a lot of negotiation but this is also partly a reason why the thing didn't hold together on the long run uh, I don't know when we will talk about this in detail because a bit of historical background here is necessary to even understand what we're talking about or what, what the hell is this and that's part in fact exactly the problem what the hell is this right we are in 2020 and nobody seems to be particularly uh, aware also in our our own Western world that this is in fact our history um, by a big influence but unfortunately nationalism wants to make people believe that wherever they live that that's the special place where the everybody you know is that, that, that what's they all they need to know unfortunately history gives a big fat slap in the face to all of these mm, absurdities because without this world here most of what we know as Europe would not even exist um, but the, the broader um, concept is, is deep because there is the, the the problem of of creating a system apparently out of nothing and that's why the, the Longobard case is so interesting because unlike other lands that more or less f kept functioning with a heavily Romanized or evidently Romanized th this was a sort of an exception right and still it, it absorbed Romanization through different uh, let's say tracks let's say different sources right it wasn't about mixing originally the Roman and the Germanic wall it was fundamentally maintaining the Germanic law but centralizing the state right unlike any other place in Europe at this time because literally the th this is no exaggeration this is well 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 ascertained by historical I, I stress it I can stress it enough Longobard Italy was the most functional public reality in Western Europe right uh, we live in a world where we have a pretty good idea what public authority is in the early Middle Ages most people have n no idea what the hell that meant right just look what the Frankish kingdom was was concretely about we made lots of videos about the Franks and uh, I think that is pretty damn clear uh, other lands were let's not talk about further north but even if you look at uh, at you know God explained read that, that was a also a mess right this reality was very different it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination uh, an, uh, a ducal anarchy as people believe this was that there is no proof of, of any kind of any secession of uh, Longobard duchies of in, the same uh, you know civil war there is nothing like that right there are at the best certain candidates struggling for the throne Re fully recognizing but the kingdom in its entirety in its functions in its prerogatives in, in its legitimacy up to the south also here this has nothing to do with the geography of it on the contrary the Duchy of Benevent was most throughout all most long word history uh, pretty mm, fine with with the the Pavese government so uh, these are unfortunate we, we talked about uh, Longbird history a lot in the first year Sverpunkt. I don't know now expanding on other stuff but we will have to come back on that also just to update a bunch of things but it's really 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 important it's the center of today's video after all but we start from the gods 
Right, because Gothic Early, and we made a video recently about, uh, especially, I don't remember the title, but it was about the difference. Ah, yeah, yeah, it was the one about the passage from a Roman to a Germanic military system, administration, I don't remember exactly. And we made a bit this parallelism. It was, in fact, the comparison between Merovingian Francia and um, Ostrogothic Italy specifically because that that's a bit not really the, the two extremes i mean ostrogothic Italy, yes it's from from the romanized part it's objectively an extreme uh the extreme the other extreme would be anglo-saxony rages to be brutal or even just a non-roman non-post-roman reality but also the, the franks are are always fascinating and basically the most important area broadly meant in its continental range of um, central European range of um, of domination in spite of even of the dec later decline but the gods as you know especially the Ulster gods had reached this pretty big and almost you know parallel power to if not you know what they were right they were comparing in fact with, with the Franks in a way and that, that it needs the, the Byzantines and the Franks to to also kind of press the system to, to take to be taken out uh, in a way it, it's naturally complex but starting even before the Ostrogothic conquest because you know in the fifth century we've seen that uh, Italy had uh, already a, a different history from the one north of the Alps right the first experience of a Germanic domination for example was not the product of an invasion unlike the other lands Otto Acker that in 476 AD had deposed the the Emperor uh, Romulus Augustus uh, found already himself in the, in the peninsula at the head of the Germanic troops and his government was distinguished basically by a continuity f with the previous institutional system and also the uh, social predominion of the Roman senatorial aristocracy right uh, this is the the main characteristic from us uh, of, of both Odoacre's and, and uh, Theodoric experience, I mean the Gothic experience, that throughout b before the Gothic War, properly at the end of a happy Gothic government of Italy, uh, Italy was functioning with a Germanic army and with a Roman civilian administration, and the two things were split, and they lived, uh, you know, in together. With, without any, like it wasn't an oppression, it was a conquest, a destruction. They, they lived as it had always ha happened. That was technically a Roman land as far as all was involved, concerned about this. There was not the, for example, the concept of territorialization of uh, ethnic Germanic domination. That is something that begins only with the Longobards. The, the Longobards arrive into Italy and decide immediately, immediately, that that's their land. Right, it's not just a place they're you know passing through randomly or that they're gone there because of Roman. No, that's their land. That's the Longobard Kingdom, and especially it's extremely clear in that mind that from Alps to to the Strait of Messina, that's the Longobard land, and that's pretty damn clear to them. Even if the Byzantines remain in the middle here and there, but also with important chunks, but their range is that one. And and that's objectively also from a strategical point of view that there, you know, for any power, especially centered in the public, it's most obviously the expansion throughout the the, the peninsula. That's also what the the Franks will do after all uh, when they conquer Italy. The, uh, but that was also another situation. Now we, we don't we don't we don't talk about it. Um, so as we know, the Roman Emperor, uh, you know that I hate to say Eastern Roman Emperor, because especially after 476, or you know at least the, the, when the, the, the last Avon posts of the West died out, which happened later, uh, was technically just the sole Roman half remained. So it was just a Roman Emperor, Zeno, right? Uh, granted Odoacer in 480 the title of Patricius, of Patrician was very important for you know delegating formally this Roman power in the land but in fact he never uh, formally recognized Odoacer as an imperial functionary properly meant right there was a fracture in that sense right after all it was a point so when in the 
uh, last years of the eight uh, of the eighties of the fifth century, the relations with Odoacer entered in, in crisis for reasons that we don't have time to explain. Zeno invited the um, I could call him the king proper, but you know it's a big word uh, even for those times in the migration year. Let's say the chief, the, the leader of the people army, because that's what technically the Germans were uh, of the Goths um, that were settled in in the Balkans, Theodoric, to invade the Italian peninsula to eliminate Odoacer's government. Uh, Thus, the first Germanic invasion of Italy, which is truly the first one in this sense to stay, you know, the Visigoths simply passed through it and then went away, so we can't talk specifically about that. There's also Gaul and suffering in Spain had experienced similar realities. Therefore, happened not in opposition with imperial government. It was not an invasion, technically, you know, in hostile intention, right? If not against the uh, Odoacer's government as such, but on the contrary, it was on behalf of the same Romans. So the war lasted traditionally from 489-493 when Theodoric eventually entered Ravenna, that was the, the administrative capital, the capital de facto of Italy, because technically Rome was always the, the capital throughout all this time, right? It's not, at first it was Milan, then it passed to Ravenna, um, but Rome, te nobody, I mean, there was no discussion about that, you'd say that bit also how Constantinople had been born, nobody was, uh, there was a properly sa sacred, intrinsic uh, prestige and authority that also, and especially with the development of the church, even after what was reinforced, Rome remained always the center of the West Pope, right? There is no doubt about this. The, the popes had already, at this point, long-range contacts with the Franks, with the, the anglo Saxons. It was a very strong and important mm, north, northwestern, southeastern axis in this regard, in Western Europe. Um, and uh, Odoacer had uh, been besieged in the city, so he eventually he is killed by Theodoric at the end of the war. The Ostrodo Ostrogothic domination did not introduce, as we were saying before, sensible novelties in the uh, institutional, juridical, and political situation. Uh, everything remained unchanged. To Theodoric, uh, historiography has mm, prevalently attributed the paternity of a collection of laws that is known as the Edictum Theodorici, so the Theodoric's Edict. So this paternity has been contested um, lots of years ago at this point, almost, uh, yeah, like 50, 60 years ago, um, because uh, it was believed at the time, it was hypothesized at this at the time, that this um, collection uh, was properly not Ostrogothic, but Visigothic, right? It would have pertained to the one of Theodoric II, in 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 um in Spain in, uh, yeah in Visigothic kingdom uh, he reigned between 453 466 if I'm not wrong um, and um, it was also hypothesized more specifically that the the author of the Edictum Theodorici could have been because the gods as you understand also called himself you know uh, in in similar ways uh, so there could be the equivocal of the um, uh, homonymy but that the material author could have been the prefect of Gaul, Magnus uh, of uh, Narbonne, because the gods controlled the area, and in the, the Visigoths controlled the area, and also these were, as you know, southern France, southern Gaul was, was very intensely Romanized reality, just like Spain was technically. So the Visigoths actually are, as you know, the most truly Romanized peoples among all the the Germans of the migration era. Um, so this Magnus of Narbonne that would have, in fact, written down, because this is an important discriminant too, the edict uh, during the the reign of the aforementioned Visigothic king around 458-59. However, the paternity of the Ostrogothic Theodoric instead has been reaffirmed 
by the most recent historiography. Right? Um, on the base of you know, of confirmation proper of the survival of some of its norms in the Italian early medieval praxis. So it was mm, uh, pretty much understood by now that the edict composed around 500, so exactly under Theodoric's time, um, was directed similarly to the Burgundian and the Visigothic laws in the practice both to the Goths and the Romans. And it had specifically, uh, as also those other Burgundian Visigothic uh, codifications, the object of disciplining some aspects of the relations between the two peoples, right? In a broader frame, as we have seen, that considerated, after all, the Roman law, at this point, jus commune, that is common law, both to the gods and the Romans. This is very important because you realize that uh, even the, the, the Ostrogoths weren't so so many. L the Longobards properly were... I mean, the, the Ostrogoths and the Longobards were some of the largest migrations um, uh, that, uh, in, in the, the lands of the Empire, exactly, but also in here they didn't surpass seemingly, you know, uh, 100, between 100 and 300,000 altogether in populations of millions, right? So we are uh, talking still of about a minority that, of course, especially in the case of the Ostrogoths, working into properly a Roman, la uh, Romanly administered land, were, mm, we know it, we've seen in, in the video about the military organization, were basically using the same Roman world in itself. They they passed through their administration, they they, they, they controlled the army, that there was a lot of continuity with the with the romanity of the whole thing. So it was natural that also the gods that were settled in Italy, scattered mostly in, in the Apennine and in, in the Alps, central northern Italy, a very few in the south, unlike the Longbirds that actually also went south, um, were, uh, were assimilated by the local population. So our, uh, already at the time considered that Italy had gone partially depopulated compared to the previous century, so there was some space after all. I mean, the hospitality split of the land wasn't something so dramatic. Uh, there's no evidence of, uh, of particular contrasts. It, it was a normal practice, right? And it, it's also important to stress that the same Gothic society was very stratified. So it was said that actually the, the richest Goth wanted to be a Roman, and, you know, the, uh, the poorest um, Roman wanted to, to, to be a Goth, fundamentally. So... Uh, we can see a lot of gods that properly were living, uh, like starting living among the peasants, because of course they lived un under the, the the control of their oligarchies, their aristocracy, and the same existence of Theodoric is very important because um, it proves the existence of a of a of a leader of a of a king proper that naturally reinforces his power on his own people when he settles in Italy. Consider that the first thing Theodoric does when he conquers Ravenna is to go to Rome to render homage to the papacy and to the Roman Senate, right? This is very important. It, it really tells you how, you know, uh, in, in, in Sintony he was, uh, especially at the beginning, with the Roman aristocracy and therefore how he saw that as a useful opportunity also to, to structure his own people that, as, as you know, the Germans were, you know, very... Um, in, you know, allergic to, to, to the idea of a, of a sovereign ruler within their people. So uh, that was a good chance in a world that already worked like that because the uh, Italy was ruled by this very tiny elite of senatorial, of senators, of Roman senators, and the, the rest were just colonists in this huge latifundia that exactly those that went destroyed by the, with the Gothic War and that favored Instead, with the spread now of the of the, uh, of the milk, like you know, of the of these col colonists that the same Goths had freed during the war to make mass again to make um, to make number against the Byzantine forces, uh, looked pretty pretty favorably to the Germanic model of the free peasantry fundamentally up uh, as a as a viable way of life. So, the anomaly of Italy compared to the 
other provinces of the Western Roman Empire persecuted in this sense uh, afterwards as well. For in 535, as we know, uh, began the uh, Byzantine invasion of Italy. I say Byzantine here to literally begin to discriminate, even if you know it's just a historiographical invention. But between the fact that, and this is very important for Gothic and Longobard, and also Frankish histories, that uh, Italy remains a contended land to start seeing the, the, the Constantinople and its empire as a foreign domination proper, right? So uh, this is crucial to understand because the same Byzantine districts that we're saying before in Italy tend to become something on their own compared to, con to Constantinople. Some will survive up to the Norman conquest, as you know, and um, in a way detached, right? Always feeling and very connected naturally also by sea often because that's uh, also the other discriminant regularly as we'll see better um, this war is disastrous um, the Byzantines actually do very well at the beginning because they conquer all the the, the peninsula in one shot which uh, shows the fragility of of, of this Romano-Germanic kingdoms broadly meant um, think about the Vandals and big knocked out also how easily they, they recover southern Spain to the Visigoths. Um, but th there is this revival, you know, there's all the, the problem between Belisarius, Narciss, you know, the, all the jealousies and the thing that mostly it's legion, like we don't properly even know what the hell happened. It's just that, as you know, the gods will basically recover power, they will m almost overthrow the Byzantines out of Italy, and in the process, Italy gets crossed twice, thrice. Um, in a row by these ravaging armies and the whole freaking country is destroyed. This ends in 553. Then, the, on, on the top of this, there is the plague, right? And many people add on it, then the Longobards. Yes, but we will see that after all, the Longobards didn't do much uh, harm, especially if you're not, you know, um, uh, a, a Byzantinist. Uh, a Byzantine fanboy, but per, 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 you don't have to be anybody's fanboy, right? But the fact is, properly realizing the, the, the civilization of it, right? The fact that this was not a dramatic reality, especially for the people that came to, to, to be invested by it. Uh, the, the worst thing happened during the Gothic War. That was the nightmare. That was the mess, right? What happened later was, in a way, also a consequence uh, you know, of recomposing this reality. Also because... The people who migrate, uh, you know, if they pass by, of course, they ravage everything. They settle. It's a different thing. And most of the destructions that we attribute to the Longbirds are actually against military. You know, the fact that at that point, the peninsula was split in two. Like, one one place there were the Longbirds, the other were the Byzantines. They were trying to knock each other out. So it's not that they began to ravage for fun. Right? They wanted to ravage because they wanted to, to weaken certain powers and to you know take their place at some point and there is no evidence of any destruction during the invasion of the north for example uh, at all and we will say something more about that later uh, so let's say that in, in the west in the reconquered west Italy was the most obviously most important reality because Africa was smaller um, the south of Spain too so Italy was actually the big shot it's what it, it's where Rome is and that's what we're by Justinian fundamentally does why does we, we I think we made three or four videos about the Justinian reconquest and I'm actually very positive about it like I think the Byzantines had to do what and they did well right aside from how they let it uh, in, in do in work in progress let's say but that it was absolutely fine and there is no deterministic or uh, reason for which the, the thing had to, to turn up into, into a mess. Um, the plague is also something they couldn't calculate. So every judgment of they should have not done it is fundamentally based on nothing. And it doesn't even explain what, what the hell, what a universal empire should be doing in that situation, which was exactly what they, in fact they did. And ne never presume that you are better or you understand things better about that world than than a Roman Emperor of the time, because you do not, like, independently from who you are, right? Uh, and of course, they knew way better than, than us what the hell they were doing and, and how to do it, in a way. So, uh, there is, um, this is not me, doesn't mean there were no mistakes. This means that they literally knew way more than we do. So, 
the fact that we say something about it, it it's ridiculous right given the documentation of sixth century europe uh, and there is also logic that we can read into it so go look at that those videos if you're curious about them uh, the point um here is that um justinian as you know issues the famous code we made a video specifically about the circulation of just justinian and, uh, uh, collection during the early Middle Ages, I mean, how it re-popped out exactly in Italy, in, in Bologna, during the, the 11th century, so much that Roman law were, you know, recovered, uh, revived, and uh, spread once again to Western Europe. Um, or, you know, at least at some levels of, of, of those communities. So, there is, there is a medieval law playlist for it. And it will change the U European history forever right? in many ways that this is very important to stress. So as we were saying, the Byzantine domination on the entire Italian peninsula lasted for a few time because in 568, uh, 9, uh, mostly 68, but also th there is the famous uh, Longbird invasion of Italy. The Longbirds also do not migrate uh, all in one chunk like you know probably it took time we know of longer birds who were actually uh, longer bird veterans the mercenaries of the byzantine army that had been settled in southern Italy even before the migration at the end of the gothic war there were lots of goths by the way in italy still that the same byzantines basically had found in these garrisons in northern Italy had let them there this will be the ones that will exactly open the gates to the longer birds instead of defending. There was no defense, also because there was no mobile army there to, st to stop the invasion so much that also since we know that the Byzantines d didn't do anything in the beginning, we are pretty positive, even if there is no direct evidence about it, that they actually let them in to create this kind of buffer state to, to counter the Merovingian expansionism that objectively at the end of the Gothic War had launched this uh, Frankish Alemannic ra raid up to up to southern Italy and Narsus had defeated them but you know it was a pretty messed up situation because now imagine you have taken out this massive gothic axis out of the way that basically held all the balance between Ar the, the Aryans and the still the pagans uh, of central Europe and from one side and the Franks and the Catholic Franks and Byzantines from the other so this is the gothic war is one of the single most important international events in here right it's not most people just study it from from in in the from the perspective of the campaign as described by Procopius but we made uh, I think pretty interesting videos about telling the the, 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 the European wide balance there that uh, the, the gothic war entailed it was Inf destroyed so um, this will change in many ways history forever the long birds are exactly the consequence of this because they were after all those that were fine with the gods being in Italy for a while even if they participated to the war against them um, at some point but the, uh, the the idea was still that the uh, the Roman Empire could not be uh, it was not appreciated by but the, the romanizing formula was not was not appreciated by all and definitely the long birds were so the least that appreciated it and that's a very important character that it's the one we were saying at the beginning that will remain fundamental in the history of Italy and Europe um, for middle ages and beyond Right, because Longbird Italy in some, uh, excuse me, Longbird Law in, in some parts of the Italian Peninsula actually lasted into common law up to like the the 19th century, right? Um, and as we have seen, it was also the the Longbird juridical activity, thanks to the edict, was at the base of the revival of the same Roman law, right? There was no grand, there was no progressistic, uh, you know, idea of Roman law as the the, the improvement. It was just. Uh, uh, um, a development on the base of this quite intense juridical activity that Longbird Kings had started and that functioned pretty damn well so that in fact it lasted up to the 11th century in current use right unaltered in in, in, uh, in great parts of this uh, a witness to how much it actually worked and those were so that was yeah easily the the, mo the most complex society in terms of um, literally of 
think about even just straight flow or literally mm, uh, amount of uh, mostly of, of yeah of trade of uh, traffics and so on but um, so I promise also I would make a video on the longbird invasion from a territorial point of view because many of you asked me like, you know, where did the longbird settle? You know, it's it's all an exoteric problem of where you know the, the, we we know pr pretty clear, right? Also, in spite of some maybe chronological uncertainty, but we have a pretty good idea of where the, the the wall boundaries actually were, and you know it's written in school books. Right? You don't have to to search for experts or. Uh, you know, or wizards to, to tell you about that. Um, the the Byzantines retained quite quite simply, you know, the Exarchate with Ravenna and the so-called Pentapolis, that which these five cities mostly of the on the Adriatic the northern area, southeast of Ravenna, and and, and also this corridor that crossed Umbria. So we, we are in the very heart of uh, the Apennine in central Italy. And it that connected, in fact, the Exarchate and Pentapolis, w Pentapolis with Rome. Right. Then there was the Neapolitan coast, uh, part of Apulia, and parts of Calabria. Now, uh, plus, if you count in Italy, the uh, the major islands of Sicily and Sardinia. While the Longobards ruled all the rest, right. And there is an important. Um, so we're talking chiefly about central, I mean northern central Italy. Uh, there was also from the other side of the corridor in the south was the Duchy of uh, Spoleto, famously enough. This will also be part eventually. Of it were all districts of the Carolingian Empire later on. Um, the Duchy of Benevent was also pretty large. We made a video on the so-called Langobardia Minor that was exactly this part south of the Umbrian corridor. Uh, that in some moments arrived to extend to good part of Apulia and uh, Calabria in the south. It was pretty, pretty large, and more generally, you could say that the Longobard settled in the uh, in the interland, basically in the continent, in the, properly in the count. That is also the the most important in a way, right? The Byzantines retained mostly the coastal areas and the city ports. And uh, Rome is technically Byzantine, but uh, you know they, the the papal government and the Roman aristocracy there will soon autonomize on their own. So much that, in fact, that at some point the Longobards will also fight uh, together with the papacy against the Exarchate, that was also doing pretty weird stuff. Uh, it's a very, I mean, it's not a very complicated history, but still there are certain economies we we want to break here like uh, there is no uh, atrocious opposition between the Romans and, and and the Longobards themselves in Italy proper right it's mostly wherever the the empire wants to retake uh, the the peninsula the Longobards actually risk to be wiped out by the joint Merovingian and Byzantine attack by the late 6th century but basically by the early 7th century nobody will ever up to the Carolingian conquest will, will never bother them anymore. The Longobards will fundamentally even be accepted by the Byzantines formally as holders of those regions of the peninsula and they will always have the upper end. It will erode gradually but effectively also the remaining Byzantine territory up to the, the Carolingian conquest. That actually eventually causes the uh, you know the migration of many Longobards in the south uh, including Paul the Deacon that would actually then join the the, long, uh, the, the Carolingian court. Um, you know, he's m the most important uh, Longobard source with the Storia Longobardorum. There is mm, a revival, a Byzantine revival in southern Italy, exactly because of that, and that is what will become in the High Middle Ages uh, with a uh, so yeah, with the, the 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 peninsula split almost in two, basically with the. The Germanic Empire, the North, the Byzantine Empire in the South, are mostly actually the Germanic uh, one overlapping with, mm, not literally, but you know, still occupying mostly the the terrestrial side of the story. The Byzantines mostly having you know the, the, the maritime control, uh, and uh, also because of the papacy that naturally uh, wanted to know none of the contendants to take over the whole peninsula 
and after all they had called the, the Franks in because otherwise the Franks might have surely invaded the place but uh, not so eagerly because after all they were allies with the Longobards contrarily why to, to, to this there was no, no actually the Franks and the Longobards were friends most of their like if you look at the international relation that they, they were al allies even uh, so I realize I digress, but yeah, I think it's important in, in passant to stress this aspect. So, starting with the Longobard law and uh, legal system. So, with the, with the Longobards, also Italy knew, therefore, this second wave of Germanic invasion, so as, just as the, you know, the Franks had conquered Gaul, uh, the Anglo-Saxons had conquered mm, at least part of uh, you know, Britain. Um, and the the second wave is distinguishing itself from the first because from on the basis of the elimination of the previous institutional forms of Roman tradition. So while um, the um, so here it's it's complicated because believe me or not, certain books, especially the ones that deal with, for example, if you study medieval law books. Most of the time, who writes them doesn't understand much about these things. I mean, they care more about the the legal side, the, the apparent legal side of the story, rarely about the practice, unless they're pretty much experts, which is rare because normally who writes books of um, medieval law always tends to stress in mostly a a modernistic perspective the, the improvement, and they look at this system, so the early Middle Ages, and say, "Ah, oh, these were primitives. We don't like them." Uh, it's pretty stupid to reason like this because first of all uh, we already explained what this systems eventually brought to uh, eventually but secondly because of course you're reali you're studying a reality that has its own context right so formally speaking for example the myth that uh, the the Longobards went so harsh with the subjugated population now the the, the Germanic Law, as you know, contemplated the the idea that th there was this people army. Uh, they were the freemen, they were the conquerors. So wherever they came to rule, uh, they were superior juridically to the conquered. So there was this. In th 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 there were also the slaves, for example. But the mostly, all the the Roman population was framed into this kind of not properly serv servile, but let's say, non f completely free um, men category. That is to say, yeah, maybe in your reality you were free, but now we are the conquerors technically, so you're still uh, under us. So there is something about you that at least in our system doesn't quite work. Now, this was on paper. The question is, what happened where the, when the Longobards arrived? We, we have not a clear idea of it. We know that there was a distinction initially. We see it also archaeologically speaking that Longbirds, for example, the first thing they did is this, they settled in the cities. I mean, they, they immediately realized that the Longbird kingdom is a kingdom of cities ruled from the city in palaces, right? Uh, it is something you don't find anywhere else in, in Latin Germanic Europe properly. Um, they... Uh, they remained separated from the local population for a generation of two. Then we, we simply see from the settlements, from the art, from the from the names, for, for everything we can realize that this didn't hold. The uh, as in in all the rest of Europe, like the uh, the, the the conquered peoples were too many. They were too um, educated. They were too dynamic. That there was no way to exist in a separated society. And this is, it's not a surprise, in fact, the Longobard Kingdom, after all, is founded around not only the cities, but properly the, the post-Roman cities, like the, the heart of, of the Longobard Kingdom is, as you know, Lombardy, from, from which, in fact, the, 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 the modern region takes the name from. The Longobards ruled from Pavia, it was the former, uh, it was a very important uh, Roman city, they, that's next door to Milan, they have all these, we know they, you know, they continued uh, issuing, I don't know, there were still hippodromes working and they, the, the kings attended the, the games, you know, the, there was all this kind of continuity in conjunction exactly with the urban 
elites that had remained after all, even after the Gothic War in these very important cities that also epigraphically are, you know, pretty clearly active pride. There is always the this proto municipalistic uh, identity and pride uh, that will be typical also of communal Italy later on. Um, uh, it's pretty clear that the what we call as the most Longobards, in a way, were also, in a way, not the most Romanized, in the, as you understand, you know, but properly the, the ones that remained mostly, that, that created the thing mostly in the most stratified reality. A bit like the gods, as we've seen. What does Theoric does? It's, it's, he plays with the aristocracy, and that's exactly what the Longobards do. Right? So much, in fact, that the, the, the most ethno-linguistically Longobard we could say areas are in fact the the poorest ones right it's the northeast uh, it's the Apennines it's areas that historically speaking remained actually pretty much influenced by this all right that really felt the thing that after all they had they were longer but at least they had become that right there, there is all a beautiful political and military history of this uh, reality think about even the the Carolingian conquest when for reasons that we don't have time to explain but essentially the northeastern Longobards that that believed to you know that uh, northeastern Italy was much more um, you know less urbanized a much more German-like. In fact, they, it will be encompassed during, during the Holy Roman Empire for a while, also in, into Bavaria, districtally speaking, regionally speaking. Th those it, were places were also more warlike, were more were the, the certain traditions, cultures, and needed and of the of the Longobard um, culture had remained more more alive, more directly alive. And this has nothing to do with the fact that they had Romanized, that they had embraced the customs of the population, but still felt that they were the true ones, the true Longobards, that, for example, Charlemagne had defeated the Sidaris, who was the king of the Longobards, however, had been not elected by the Longobards as by tradition, but by the, um, the papacy, fundamentally, and the Franks, right? Um, the Longobard kingdom was an elective one, it was a, basically a, the exception of a functionally elective monarchy, right? Which you don't find much else, right? Look at the Visigothic king, it was a, you know, the kings had no power. In Longobard Italy, they had also thanks to the fact that there weren't, unlike in fact Gaul or Spain, this dramatically powerful uh, aristocracies, but uh, wealth was more evenly distributed, so it was easier to, to control the various groups of society. So, this fact that, of course, in the Germanic law, there was no trace of uh, people kind of becoming German right in in, uh, in in the formal but because if you read the edict there is no attention to this right uh, nobody says you know here we have a bunch of Romans we're still Romans we don't know how to but we don't know how what to do with them they live separately from it but there is not, not nothing of this. Uh, and of course there was nothing of this. What language is the Edict written in? In, Lo in Longbert? Longbert was a beautiful Germanic language. We, we have some hint also from the Edict that, that has some Latinized verb. But the, in fact, the language is Latin. We know the Edict was known and people appealed to, to the kings that there was a very direct communication. Old kingdom wide it was issued for being understood by the Romans population yes these were Longobards but they spoke Romans right they spoke a Roman language um, that was the language of the kingdom uh, by the time Rotary writes this which is um, in the first half of the towards the, the mid 7th century uh, of course the Longobards had already mixed with the rest, right? They had already deluded themselves with the rest. And I'll bite that of course they recognize their their older tradition so much that they even uh, you know, Rotary inserts the prologue of the you know the Legion, the list of kings, right? Also to legitimize its power and so on. The system was most obviously a local one. <laughs> right? And and the the fact is why? Because 
as we were saying, more or less, this distinction had ceased. But it had properly not even worked since the beginning. Because what do you do? You you arrive in this real. You arrive in you arrive in a city. We're talking about um, Milan, uh, Verona. These were all uh, Pavia. You know, were all. If you look at other regions in the Roman Empire, these were the largest cities among the largest cities, right? Um, that existed there. These are literally some of the largest cities in Europe, um, and you arrive, you settle in these cities, and and you think they were inhabited, and you think that they they could control the population just by you know militarizing, you know garrisoning the place, and they mixed with them. Um, and therefore, there was no uh, need to stress, okay, the process of how to pass from one juridical uh, ethnicity to another. It was said, okay, are you Longbird? Yes. You know, nobody cared. The important is that you obeyed the law. What do you issue a law? Because you want things made to work after all. And we know that with the, the attic, things did work fairly well, in fact. Another myth. Uh, is the idea that the longer birds so were, aside from ferocious brutes, but they were also, um, un, you know, uncompromisingly um, Aryans, and that therefore there was this terrible ca discrimination against the Catholics. There is not a single, and I stress not even one, episode of any form of uh, persecution of discrimination on a religious base in Longobard society, in all the sources, in all the reality, in the archaeological reality. This was true, even if you look at the Vandals. The Vandals are these terrible Aryans, destroyed all the bishops. Archaeology in Africa has showed us that there is no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, I think j just one diocese or, or two in a, in, our, in a over hundreds or something like I don't remember what churches I don't, I don't remember what the point was but for the rest there is no evidence of that we know life went on the same exact way it had gone the same it's here uh, people mistake a sort of uh, you know the, the destructions of the gothic wars um, to the regression followed by the Longbird invasion right as if uh, I don't know, by the 6th or the 7th century, the Byzantine, a Byzantine early could recover and be in some, something so advanced and pro... Uh, ha, ha, do you realize what happened to the rest of the empire in these same years? Do you know what that society evolved into? Do you know what contraction there was war in, all over Eurasia, including these territories and Europe, and the, the Byzantine Empire, and the Germanic, Germanic War? Um, the Longbirds settled in an area, in, in in a reality that was already the one it was. There was nothing left to 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 damage in a way. They present themselves, by the way, in in a reality where the Byzantine strongholds hold, right? In in, in especially in central uh, Italy, they 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 don't want them to to go further, but. They exist, militarily speaking, therefore there is a contrast in that sense, but in the, the long-run migration in itself does not bring to any, even war. Uh, the, there is a myth, I don't remember wh wh if it's uh, Paul Tadeokan that wants to repeat the literary topos of the siege of Ravenna by Theodoric, and says that Pavia fell after three years, there is no evidence of that. It's just that source, and there is no archaeological evidence, there is no other documentary evidence. It's a cliche of a later source. Um, and no conflict is, uh, is is shown here. Even the Byzantine garrisons of northern Italy in these alpine passes and lakes, we know that they held for, for a while, but that also they didn't properly fight against the Longbirds. That is to say, okay, they were within and they controlled this thing, hoping at some point the Byzantine would, would come back. But there was there were regular exchanges between uh, the Longbird authorities and, and these strongholds that n now were cut out from the mint. Um, and they were on their own. And eventually they 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 surrendered without without a fight peacefully. There was no violence. And we're talking about important areas of, of the peninsula. Right. War, devastations, destructions, answered exclusively in realities where, you know, the place is garrisoned by the enemies. You don't have 
uh, way to, to, to storm the stronghold, so you pillage around, which is literally what every single people in the world did at the time. For the rest, we do not have any evidence of gratuitous violence, in, 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 or not even a, of regular systematic violence, but not even sometimes any actual evidence of violence in, in the lands occupied by the Longbirds. Why would you do that if you have to stay there? Right? There was nobody who would resist. There weren't aristocracies. They had been depleted by the Gothic. It was a catastrophe for the senators. They fled to Constantinople. It was a mess. But the peasantry, actually, uh, after the, the violences, the destructions, you know, these guys arrived and said, you know what? These do not exploit me as the, 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 the senator does. They are not trying to enforce as the system. They're, they're simply trying to govern a reality together with the, the locals who have remained. They have an aristocracy, but it's a very modest one. There's a way to organize something civil, right? Uh, there is just the most traumatic problem uh, for will be before the, the Frankish and Byzantine invasions of the Po Ballet, you know, this 10 years of so-called ducal anarchy, because there was objectively no king. So the dukes wanted, when they settled, just wanted to, to, to create, the Longobard dukes, to create their own fact, uh, seigniory and to, to leave from there. And, of course, they also fought against each other. There were lots of them who actually were from the Byzantine side, too. And were full of Longobards in the Byzantine army in this uh, generation, which is, by the way, the same time in which the Strategicon is written. Right? Um, so, what the, the the source stated when talking about the blonde-haired peoples that are the Germans is mostly influenced by. It's, I mean, the Germans were pretty homogeneous in their way of fighting, so it's mostly thinking of the Longobards in a way. So, also the problem of the fact that. The Longobards were uh, uh, formerly Aryans, but actually pagans when they migrated into the peninsula is uh, not particularly great. Italy was overwhelmingly Catholic, uh, but we know what that meant after a few centuries of Christian formal Christianization was full of pagans. And also, um, there was, um, I mean, it was a system that was, could include both things, right? Maximally, the only con contrast that could be was with Catholic uh, bishops that still refer to, to Roman papacy, but were under the Catholic, uh, excuse me, the, the Longobard kingdom. But even in there, we don't have evidence of violence or discrimination. So it was just a problem because they, they, they naturally wanted to normalize the relations, especially with Rome, not much with the empire, actually, because... Actually, both the papacy and the, and the Longobards take often side against the uh, eccentric um, uh, heterodoxies, let's to, 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 to be mild about it, of, of uh, Constantinople that are making a uh, very equilibristic religious policy in order to save the Near East and Egypt from, from the various heresies that had spread there to compromise with them. Uh, there is actually a great and proper Italic unity in this regard. Right, that there is the realization that this land, after all, is in a precarious equilibrium up to uh, the the beginning of the 7th century, from which, in fact, the Longobard kingdom reinforces itself uh, and starts giving itself even the code, even this, uh, this means of government that are most even also Roman tradition. Right, the Longobards didn't didn't write, didn't uh, you know, and, and surely they didn't speak in Latin, so. The code, Rotary's code, is the clear evidence of uh, a transition of Longobard culture into a Romance land that does not renounce to Germanicity as politically, institutionally, and juridically, but that has obviously created all this thanks to the. Uh, and we even know of some individual, this kind of the, the last good, you know, educated aristocracies of. Um, of Roman Italy that provided this important uh, knowledge, know-how, skills, etc., to create, to to start ruling from a centralized, a central direction, at least you know, from from a palace, from you know, it was specific mm, administration, with a specific territorialization of power, which is something that the Longbirds never had, right? No, nobody in the Barbaricum had a 
uh, the idea that, that there was a land that was like that one and that's um, their land. They, these guys were always on the move, so um, there was no particular attachment to that, rather to, to their own ethnic identity as a people, which is in fact what the Longobards maintain throughout all this time overwhelmingly. Right? And the Longobards are some of the very few and surely the most important people that maintained among the Germanic ones their original ethnonym. Right? When the Romans conquered Germany back in the day, uh, Tiberius destroys these guys and says these are the Longobards. So in Latin says that by the beginning of the first century AD the, the Longobard ethnonym was still there. Right. There are no Franks, there are no Alamanni, neither there is a very few people that maintain their name. The Longobards do, and they're even small. So it was the, the, the cliche, which is probably true though, is that they had this insane um, sense of themselves. Uh, they were extremely ferocious. This is stated very often by the Roman sources. It ba basically took pride to be at war constantly with everybody who was around. Right. So they, they were wild, right? If you, if you study the Longobard language, you can even perceive it, right? The, this almost hissing sounds, this beautiful, beautiful uh, words, beautiful name. If you look at their art, right? Look at Longobard art when they settled in Italy in the, in the first, very first generations. These people were mentally devastated, like you know that they, they were dangerous, and and objectively they they had those ferocious mentality ideal, right? The Germanic world was was proud and um, and um, and uh, honored by uh, by by inflicting pain and sufferance on the on who was deemed to be impure right inferior that you know it didn't stand from like what did you look like or what did you say right and it was extremely violent this is witnessed uh, in in the first moment of the conquest but even in there there is no evidence of uh, a destructive relation with these populations at all. They understood immediately what the business was. They realized brilliantly that not only if they wanted to go on, they had to, to unite into a kingdom that truly emerges not because of a powerful clan leader that imposes itself on all, all, all the others, like it had happened with the Goths or with the Franks, but through election, which, by the way, was the the traditional Germanic way of doing the thing, and it even worked, right? It's obviously, as we've seen, a, a you know, a, if you want a, a random outcome, because even the, the land they settle in favored this, as we've seen, there weren't powerful aristocracies that would, could feed this resistance, this secession, this privatization of power. So, the thing actually works, and actually, longer bird history is the example of a great success, of an enormous accomplishment, a civil accomplishment, and this is often forgotten. People don't talk about this, they, they just babble about, you know, it's but they mostly name them, because for most people this history ends up with the 6th century, because most people look at this story from the Roman perspective, so say, okay, the Longobards arrived, it's the end, they were the worst, uh, you know, uh, sad ending. No, it was the beginning of another year. And you find in the alleged darkest hour of these all sources, like in seventh century, beginning of seventh century Long Lombardy, um, that say, you know what, the, you know that saw as a providential thing that the Longbirds had come. This is something that the the Gregory of Tours also wrote, for example, for the Franks, that others realized because you you know what, these guys gave stability. What do people care about? If you're Roman or if you're German, right? These are the idiocies that the, the, the disturbed kids are fed with by, by by 19th century. The delusions. These worlds didn't give. It. These worlds had to worry how to survive, so they didn't give a damn about this garbage. They looked at facts and how things worked, and this thing began to work pretty damn well, too well. Right, because the Byzantines at some point had to give up to even think they could dislodge these guys. And why? Because there was some infrastructural power that they could... It was the populace that was not with them anymore. And that's always like that. It's not about the land, it's about the people. 
it's always about the people. Remember this, because it's very meaningful for, for a healthy historical understanding. So as we were saying before, the, the Longobards passed from this also semi-nomadic uh, lifestyle to full sedentarization. This triggered a lot of changes in their realities and that are reflected already probably by, by Rothery's code. Right, it's obviously it's obvious that Rothery is uh, not describing in, by 643 when the, the code was issued um, a Longbird world. He's talking about a, a Romanized uh, a, a Romans land now governed by several generations by Longbirds. There are typically Ger Germanic institutions, as we were saying, and in fact, the, the code is fully Germanic. This is important to stress, like it's not like the previous, like the the Gothic or Burgundian laws. This is about that we're basically ro the Thelosian code with some Germanic influence. This is exclusively Germanic, right? There are, it's the society that is not Germanic, but the institutions are fully Germanic juridically speaking, this is very important to stress because it's the key to understand that very society. They were all longer birds. That's why you don't find the Romans in the sources, because they had all become like this. And it was a, to the full advantage of the monarchy to, to think like this, because what kind of monarchy wants to rule on a fragmented reality? Well, what the monarchies tend to do, territorially speaking, is to homogenize, to flatten, to control better. And that's exactly what the system was about. Also because there weren't dramatic differences, as we've seen, also between an average Longbird and an average uh, Italian inhabitant that was, you know, had found himself in that situation. For example, as far as the elective monarchy was concerned, was the, um, the, the traditional assembly of the free Longbirds, the Geir and Thicks, right, that had to provide this... Uh, even the issuing of new laws, for example, so that the king tactically had to approve its uh, its uh, laws through the approval of the Longbird people. This was normally, you know, of course, it's not that they did like back in the day, the, you know, the, the, the assembly literally produced this, but th there was a formality uh, in that we know of, of, of situations in which yeah, some some you know the notables, the aristocracy was was called up to 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 sanction this in a way. There were no contracts whatsoever. These laws were never um, obstacles. There was nobody ever said no. We don't want this, right? There were laws that, of course, were unpopular, but there was no movement or you know secession, rebellion, something. You know, no, we don't want this institution, this this juridical system. No, none of that by the slightest throughout all the Longobard kingdom. Um, the um, the the first book that uh, is approved, I mean, the, the first code that uh, is, as we've seen, the the one that will maintain the, the essential nucleus of the edict, right? To which eventually other integrations, other customs, other laws will be added uh, up to the year seven hundred fifty five by other kings. Right, there were uh, less laws. You know, the, the system is pretty simple. It's literally a list of laws, right? And new kings issued new laws by uh, simply, you know, still making function the old code and adding things that they needed uh, new, a new. Uh, because it, it's also important to stress that these laws weren't technically emanated as a as in the Roman law, that there is a sophisticated system of, you know, integrated institutions that work all as to get, you know, they came one after one for specific needs. So they didn't even discipline the whole society. There are specific issues, specific topics that recur. Some are even funny but to, to read, but if you if you understand their logic, they, they actually make a lot of sense. Uh, and they were really trying, we know it because, thankfully, uh, Italy, that is the best documented country at this point in the juridical practice, is exactly 
uh, showing how uh, through the sources how this these laws were 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 applied and they were applied and pretty damn well. We know how the the the, the, the single juridical cases that that exist trials uh, private matters and it was a, a code a, a legal system that worked well and and it was really applicable it was no propaganda it was no uh king started to to enforce this no no it, it worked and it worked all over the kingdom right in the same way this is what is astonishing now we we don't have time to explain also how longobard administration worked but literally like there was in every city where there was the city of the duchy actually a small uh, a palace that was in basically in smaller scale the, by importance the palace of of the capital of pavia where the king was right and people from that uh, from that duchy went to to this palace where there was a, a, a long uh, a public functionary that responded for the king and sometimes even passing the most the hottest topics like you know to to the king himself and we have ev direct evidence of this happen so we know the thing did actually work. Find a system that works like this all over Western. There, there's not. There, there's no country to work like this. And this is what it makes it amazing. And the addict by itself is extraordinary. Right? It, it, it talks very deeply about this society. Um, there are naturally some influences received either by the, the, the Catholic Church or the Roman law by uh, functionality, right? Um, sometimes in the form, also in the contents, but not being um, an ex you know uh, an external element to to the code itself. It, it's really absorbed by it, and it works in, in the in the Longbert way, we could say, so that it, it doesn't interfere also with, uh, or better, it, it's functional to the rest. It's simply an addition, right? It's not an allogen element. And that's a, it's naturally filtered through the the lens of the long bird society and needs. Right. This discipline appears very interesting at many levels. For example, the norms present the individualistic uh, tone that we have seen, mm, you know, in, in the other in other Germanic uh, laws that are interested specifically to discipline the various situations in which a subject can find himself in a juridically meaningful act or relation without attempting to define broader categories within to frame the, the various, uh, you know, the similar cases. It was not needed, right? In a medieval law, you know, especially those written by modernists, you know, um, manual, you will find, you know, the, ah, yeah, these were simple, they were not categories, ha, huh, this is not like the Roman law, it, it, why, why should have it been? Right, this was an early medieval society, it was not a Roman society of, you know, of late antiquity. It was a completely different thing, was, what was the, the practical use of creating a category? What, what, what do you think that in applicated, um, in, in the juridical, in the legal practice, this would, would change for them? It's an intellectualistic uh, mirage to pretend that this world needed that. And uh, this doesn't speak for the, the extreme flexibility of this system that favored, thanks exactly to this in part, to the, the uh, composition of a lot of problems that this society had and that were solved over time, thanks exactly to the system. The penalty uh, contemplated for the uh, authors of actions that were against the law consisted generally in a compositio, in Latin, right, which is the uh, pay naturally of a sum of the, or a certain amount of, um, of goods, right, that substituted the more bloody feud that the long birds were quite fascinated by, you know, by, as any German uh, that was the way to which to handle the situation. This is very different now. Like in the barbarism out there in Central Europe, you can't, uh, there's no state whatsoever, there's no public authority, people do not even know what it is. Uh, there are just 
you know, it's the, the, the law of the stronger, so the feud is just a way to say, okay, you killed one of my clan, I, I will kill you one of your clan, so we are, we are droll. Um, one could say it even worked um, if, you know, the, the broader picture was not kind of a nightmarish <laughs> situation. Naturally, when the Longobards settled down here and they start to reflect on the, the possibilities of how this could work, okay, let's not use just violence, but let's, given that now there is properly a wealth, right, these people have sedentarized, they have land, hence they have animals, they have income of some form, so they can pay in other ways, without killing each other every freaking damn time. Albeit it was still in uh, vogue, let's say, you know, to, um, uh, to, to, to do it. Um, and the, the idea was, however, the same one of the old feud, that is to say this, this payment could compensate, could recalibrate the, the community given the, the losses that have been. Uh, you understand it's not a sophisticated mechanism, but it did work. Also because these people were quite serious about it, right? And there weren't, after all, many other ways to, to solve the situation. But it did pass through public control, which is now a very important thing, because it's not that you go do this. I mean, m many people presumably did this also privately without recurring to justice. It's not that the, the monarchy actually controlled, uh, we're not talking about the, mo the contemporary st state, the, the, the con early medieval control by, by the, the, the highest authorities w was somewhat to lose in any case. But here, objectively, the, the thing happen like if one didn't want to pay for a for a crime you know you could go to the king and the king would enforce that and this is what is important here that there is a real authority that makes law respected which previously had not existed so it's there is even even much of a of a of a change in terms of of the specific jur uh, legal uh, you know uh, legal praxis, it's, it's literally about the, the he who makes it in force that reveals an important presence of public authority. Naturally, also in here, the compositio was modulated on the social value of the damaged, right, that was defined by his own price, his, her own price, the guidrigiltus, right, it's the vergeld essentially. It's the you see here it's the, the Latinization of a Germanic term. It's plenty of that in, in the code, and it's interesting to read because something is written still in the Germanic way because they didn't they hadn't found a a better way to to express it in Latin and after and this naturally shows also how the local culture had partly Germanized because it was clear at least to, to most people what even that Germanic name really meant. Which is not surprising, given that, for example, modern Italian still maintains a lot of Germanic words that are overwhelmingly, f in fact, from the Longobard times, and has have to do exactly also with certain specific aspects of those words. For example, things related to war, um, to uh, you know, to a animals. Uh, I mean, uh, the ones of uh, you know, farming animals, let's say, and other more material reality. And that that was the Longobard world in a way. For what then concerns the discipline of intersubjective relations, we find the confirmation of the centrality of the family as a primary social cell, right? Guided by the father. Uh, this is interesting because you could say it's Germanic, but it's broadly a, a kind of a Indo-European institution. Think about the same Romans of the pater familias. These were all heavily patriarchal societies. Um, and we're not talking about small families, so talking about extended clans, right? So there was someone who was responsible, after all, for them. Naturally, with the sedentarization, the family, the, the extended clan dilutes, uh, settles down, uh, starts living in different, you know, in different ways. So there is a nuclearization of family, tendentially in the longer reality over time, but it's still naturally and obviously and uh, unavoidably a patriarchal reality. So the juridical condition of, of the woman was clearly indicated by the absence of a vergelt, 
that concerned her. The Longobard woman obviously didn't participate to the armed defense of the people. And before you say anything, no, Germanic women normally didn't fight at all. This is a modern invention because of political reasons of today's times. There is nothing strange in finding a woman buried with a, with a weapon or even finding in Germanic legions armed women, but this has nothing to do with what the reality showed by everything from archaeology, from juridical practice, from the political and social reality of those times, every kind of source uh, has to do, right? So let's cut it with this because it's uh, it's ridiculous how we have to uh, alter history because you see if you think something like that it's because you simply have never studied these things right but because it's it's so quite even just quantitatively speaking so overwhelming the evidence that that is not the case that uh, just uh, a un deeply uneducated society uh, like our own can believe in such things and it's not a matter of belief because you presume it's we actually know it's not like that, right? Um, so, this was also a positive thing, because in Longobard culture, for example, vo women had an enormous importance, like, throughout all history, right? Just a bunch of idiots like us can think at some point that women didn't have importance in society. This has nothing to do, unfortunately, for them with the, the equality of their rights, but it doesn't take into consideration a contextual reality that even in the mindset of these women could could not leave them any other chance of, of, of living like that. It's ridiculous when we think that, you know what a lot of, uh, of these uh, ideologues do is that they, they, they look at these laws that are were written down and say, oh, you know, look at the addict of Rosary, that's because they were Christianized, that's because they had Romanized and those were the, the pigs and the oppressors, right, you know, and instead the Scandinavian world was so free and then the women could, could do whatever they want. No. In those worlds, if a woman dared to come out of her pre-arranged social role was at best uh, ostracized, at worst drawn into swamps. Right, so let's try to be, at least to give the impression to, at least to, to, to seem to be intelligent people here. And not, let's not insult the, the dignity of the, I would say the minimal, but say the average uh, human intelligence. Because at, at this point it's become literally ridiculous. Let's be honest about this. If you're not studied this stuff from historiography, you don't know it. Right, there is not an alternative for which you can invent it because it makes you feel better just because you're a moron in today's world. Uh, change that by studying history. Right, that's much better. Right, and and look at what women were in Longobard society, which is beautiful. There are enormous uh, examples. There are even Longobard women fighting. There is an example actually of um, properly of a. But that was in a very elitary uh, context, and th there is not much of an evidence of this. There is in the founding myth of the Longbirds also the fact that women, uh, now I should sell all the myth, but let's say that they at least fake to be men in front of Odin to, to be more numerous and to, to stress at that point not the fact that they were warriors, even though they, because they literally brought their hair in front of their faces to show as if they had beards, and that's also what brings the ethnonym to the Longobards as properly anodinic people, because that's what they were by the founding myth. But because that was a myth of people and not a myth of elite, right? They wanted to show that everybody in that society, from, from a properly, in terms of, of stock, literally of, of people, were um, were equal, but that has nothing to do with the equality of women, right? That were always, uh, unfortunately, they were autonomous um, juridical subjects, but they they were not free. They could do something, but they couldn't do whatever they wanted, including. And this is true, the more we, we get to the Germanic roots of it, of course, they couldn't do anything that their fathers, their brothers, their, their husbands didn't want them to do. Including marrying at the same time. She didn't have full capacity of action. Right? It was not allowed. Right? And this, is, this was true as in, in all the other Germanic laws. Um, and I would say, in fact, the 
the, the Longbird Woman was even more, you know, it was technically mm, freer. Yeah, they received a lot of stuff in terms of uh, even testaments. I mean, there was a way they 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 were they managed their own uh, properties, and this is actually very similar to the late antique Roman reality. Right, the fact that in the northern world you don't find much, uh, you, you find things like, yeah, technically women could di divorce. Uh, it's not because they, they could divorce. Here in the Christian reality, of course they could. But the point is that it's not that in the, in the north they, they could, uh, of course they could divorce if there was something like, you know, the, the, the husband was unfertile. There was an issue. It was the only way even the church accepted that the, the, the matrimony was invalid properly. So it had never been celebrated. But. Uh, in the northern world, it was like they could divorce, but why? Because even if there were realities that normally had imposed, normally imposed that situation, but because there was a push from their relative clans, right? It was not a matter of you know now everybody can can divorce. It was an extremely serious thing to divorce at the point, because w w what that had happened that means two clans breaking their their bond. Why is this woman divorcing? What, what's the problem? That what the other man has got offended by this? That, that there must be a problem. So there was an institution that allowed the possibility, just like in here, um, but that was Christianized in the process. But y in that world, y there, there were apparently way less. Um, there was way less tutelage of the individuality of this woman. She was overly protected, but in this sense, overly controlled. In here. She was also pretty seriously controlled, but still, throughout the Longbird, um, you know, uh, to, to the Longbird ethics, we, uh, the Longbird laws and juridical practice, we see that the Longbird woman is actually gaining more autonomy than before. So, what does that mean? Uh, if this was a most evenly Roman and, and Catholic reality, uh, that uh, the bad and evil repressive uh, facts were just there, uh, you know, in the Christian. No, it, it's the other way around. So how to explain that? Well, the the point is that at the origin, at the root of those societies, there wasn't much freedom. And you see it clearly from this, exactly from this juridical practice. Um, the matrimony was a contract. Mm, there wasn't much of a. It was a kind of a exchange and compensation, because of this. Um, and there was a tutelage, and so that in every juridically relevant act, her will had to be integrated by the one of the most authoritative male component of the family. To whom was recognized a power slash tutelage on her that was known as mundium, and mundualis was in fact the title holder of such mundus. There wasn't a specific woman. This is interesting because on uh, widows or you know orphans, for example, um, the king became the mundium holder of, of such women, which is also very fascinating because naturally that's still a part of public. Uh, uh, you know, of power that get, gets absorbed by the public authority in that regard, but that has even also the capacity of, of helping these people that are the weakest elements of this society, juridically. Uh, so the moon, however, uh, regularly, um, uh, you know, uh, was pertained to the, the normally in, um, as a list by to the father, the husband, the brother, the son, too, of course, and we find situations in which, in fact, longer women were like uh, now remained only with a, with a male son, for example, who was very young, and they we know from the contractual practice they were evidently managing the house in their stead, right? But technically, their sons had a, the moon on, on her, right? And and this reveals an autonomy and dynamism that you don't find it much elsewhere in this regard. It means that, after all, they were freer. Because society was simply freer, because it was, it was richer. These people had more money than, uh, individually than other people in Europe, so of course they were f simply freer, but it's like today's world. Why are women freer in here? Because of course they have the possibility that before society also prevented them from having, but that were 
deriving from the, the the greater poverty of societies for which you know there wasn't many other way to to sustain each other at that point as a as a family if, if, if this relation did not exist so we can find this this separate you know the, this uh, unbalance here in by comparison to these various lands um, and this is uh, the centrality of the family is uh, seen also in the discipline of successions of inheritance the familiar asset passed to the male sons of the of who had passed and it was not contemplated the testamentary disposition at the beginning at the beginning then we know that in practice this happening eventually would also be sanctioned as uh, as viable Right, and this was already happening by itself because society was still, society was still doing it on the rain, their own. Then the seigniory on the land, which is also an important topic, uh, appears sensibly different from the Roman dominium. It's indicated by the term gavere, that expressed the direct relation between subject and good and. Uh, Therefore, it, it, it ended up to comprehend all the forms of utilization of, of the goods, specifically all the forms. Um, this means that uh, relatively to the, you know, to like land or other assets, the, the Roman law divided between dominium and jura in re aliena, right? Which means either a full possession or, you know, uh, you basically have some rights in someone else's property but for 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 example for a contract right because you rent it please uh, and therefore in order to admit a plurality of seigneuries on on the same object in the contractual manner uh, finally it was mostly formalism that dominated it was essential for the birth of uh, of the contract uh, through uh, the act or a solemn ritual that was what existed in Germanic society before, mm, you know, literacy. That rendered, um, you know, that uh, warned, announced the society, you know, showed the society, officialized it pro pro publicly uh, to the community the the agreement, how, how it had happened, right? So most of the agreements, even in contractual, you know, in literate realities at this point, also were vocal right um, it wasn't strange but naturally with the greater the interests became and the more the societies wanted to um, uh, to sanction it officially you know so that it could document that and we're talking about important things like how to use a property there were lots in fact of um, of trials in, in uh, Longobard courts exactly these cases um, and this was exactly aimed at that because so that the judgment could be ba the sentence could be founded on on a witness of those who had um, either assisted to the act, but now also how to they could provide a a document, a contract in uh, as an evidence in their stead. And this was way more useful than the ordeal through which normally, you know, the long birds instead solved these problems. That is to say, uh, I heard that, I mean, it was all vocal, it was all oral, right? So people said, no, I heard this, I heard that, they didn't know how to solve the matter. Okay, they, they recurred to the duel. It's not a very good way of making justice, is it? Uh, what kind of way is that? I, I, I'm somewhat puzzled by you know, people want to be, to, to, to be romantic or nostalgic, but end up just in sounding idiotic and thinking that, you know, it, it's a positive thing to solve matters uh, as gentlemen through a, a, du a judicial duel. Well, you know, more than a gentleman, it sounds like a very stupid person. Like, you know, what kind of justice is that, right? Are you a beast? Are you a tribal warrior? What kind of person are you? Right? And th this was actually a very serious concern for the Longobard kings that at some point tried fact to even get rid by the 8th century of the judicial duel but society did not respond because they, it was so imbued with that system that after all was pretty common in Europe that there was no way and, and the king uh, this is Lutbrand it says explicitly you know uh, 
this thing doesn't work, but we tried to enforce it and there was no way to, to eradicate it. And this naturally also shows the limit of a government, of a monarchy in the early medieval Europe, of course. Um, but there are other examples. For example, in, in the Longbert Code, there is the uh, Vadia procedure that ensured, uh, quote, in Latin, firmitas et stabilitas, right, so firmity and stability, to render uh, unassailable certain pacts and contracts of, of every type that consisted basically in the consignment of a lengx, right, or uh, later on by, by a simple stick actually, um, from the side of mm, those, you know, the side it was guaranteeing in the hands of who benefited of the guarantee and consigning therefore his arm he who guaranteed rendered uh, known to the community to renounce pre uh, preemptively to the opposition via a judiciary duel, as you understand, to a, 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 you know, an eventual action from, from the other side. This is another positive uh, passage that we see from the Germanic reality. Right, it's a bit more, you know, civil, civil way of behaving, and of of actually settling the matter, right? And this naturally uh, exists because of the of the different contexts that allows, you know, that, that you know this system that the previous system could have worked well in the barbaricum. Now, it didn't. Even. Also, for what concerns the transfer on, of the seigneury on, on a non-movable good, the purchaser uh, was introduced by the seller in the, uh, in the possession of the land and uh, taking in, in hand either a clod of earth or a tuft of, of, of grass, showed it to the bystanders um, to make it known to the community his new right, right? And while the passage of scenery over a uh, mobile good happened through the traditio, through the, the formal uh, consignment of the object, the, uh, you know, the, the acquisition of a non-movable uh, asset happened through this new system. In the years following Rotary's edict, um, naturally, uh, society kept changing. So um, there were uh, new, uh, you know, in, in laws introduced uh, in the code that uh, exemplified new customs that were, you know, approved. In fact, by the popular assembly to the previous ones, uh, there was, for example the reception of the Roman successory rule of the representation according to which to the um, descendants of the prematurely died son of the of the past so descendants that the originary Longobard successory di discipline excluded from the uh, inheritance went a quota of property of inheritance that would have instead uh, oh, to, to their father, right? So this means that th there is a passage from the declinic idea that after all is, is someone prematurely, th this existed also in the rest of Germanic court that basically, I don't know if um, your, um, uh, you know, there is this, this the son, for example, of a, uh, of a, that has died uh, before his father, right? But he also had his own children. Well, these children would have not received the inheritance before. It would have come back to their father because the idea was that this patriarchal reality, the clan, had maintained its unity because this inheritance system was designed for a, a reality in, in Central Europe where, you know, the, 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 sing, the, the single most obsessive thing was to maintain the clan intact because that was the only way, the, the, the only way to which they could all survive as a client in, in that mess, right? Um, so it, all this wealth had to be controlled by a, a head of the family. Now, in the senatorized reality, why wouldn't the children uh, inherit the... Because it was thought before that the clan would, after all, share and redistribute this wealth in a way. It was also a very survival rate thing, so 
uh, in a way it's not that these children were brutally excluded but it, they, they were thought mostly to belong to the clan than being someone's uh, children right and, and and that's the point instead in in Italy now the, the thing changes so that they can inherit their father's uh, good and this is also you know a pretty civilized thing to to, to issue legally speaking um, and naturally there was a gradual opening also of, of longer birth society to a lot of other aspects now we were talking about a fully Christian and Catholic reality right the Longbirds were Aryans at least, they also had a lot of pagan relic, but they, they gradually get converted. I mean, there is definitely a, a greater unity of also the ecclesiastical administration of the kingdom there is a, that supports the, the, the kings, um, that starts finally, you know, accepting, you know, this, um, the, 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 that converts to Catholicism, that understand the, the enormous potential, to this unity, this, the surpassing of this ambiguity uh, entailed. Right, the the Franks, as we've seen, were the only Germans that passed from paganism to to, to Catholicism directly. You know, all these other peoples went passed through Arianism for for a reason of international, you know, opposition, namely uh, and somewhat uh, subtle, tacit opposition to 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 Romanization. But eventually, they 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 realize, especially when they settle down in this overwhelmingly Catholic land, it's useless, right? It actually weakens their power. So, um, the Longobard kingdom grows pretty, uh, pretty positively in this sense. Um, there are interesting, uh, th the single most important addition to uh, Rotary's edict is the one of the King Lutbrand, 712-744, that is considered the greatest Longobard king. Um, Objectively, that's the, the, the apex also of Longobard power. It's a, it's a system that, in a way, is uh, becoming more uh, synetic and difficult to control because it's getting richer. Here we're entering the 8th century, so these are exactly the areas of Europe from which economy revives um, uh, the earliest. And uh, so there are, in fact, there is a lot of attention to contractual realities. And in fact, um, Lutbrand in the 91st chapter, known as the script, is on the, uh, on the written uh, of, of 727, granted to the contractors to substitute uh, the uh, older negotial forms with a cartula, right? So officially, this or is sanctioned legally. So a, a document, a written contract written however by a scribe in fact um, a cartula that could be mm, however written down according to one of the two personal laws the Roman and the Longobard one the, that and this is important because actually the both of them were present in the kingdom Right, the Longobards, yes, we've seen how rare, the, if you remember, Lutbrand's kingdom is the one in which uh, they, the Longobards take Ravenna. There are all these Romans that enter en masse in, in the, uh, at least that exist in these areas that are uh, now ruled by the Longobards after the Byzantines. Uh, but naturally, there were Romans, especially merchants, right, that lived in the Longobard kingdom at, at all times, and simply other people in that in part had remained Roman because, after all, maybe they, they didn't care, they, they, they wouldn't change much in their in certain contexts. While the, the majority was overwhelmingly Longobard, but of course both uh, were both existed. It's just that it, it didn't depend on the Longobard kings to to discipline the Roman law, right? What the Longberg King uh, was doing here is was of course recognizing the validity of the Roman c uh, uh, contractual norms, right? And if two Longbirds, this has nothing to do with if you are Longbird or Roman. Like if two Longbirds find it more convenient to write a, do uh, uh, a contract, to sign a contract the Roman way, because maybe they have some advantage from the Roman uh, law that uh, for that specific business they can and the longer law is fine with that right also th there would be to, to to stress that the roman law that we intend here is not literally 
the late antique either Theodos and eventually Justinian and compilation. It's probably um, another form of common of uh, of custom that of common law that had remained in Byzantine territories that had, however, changed in the juridical practice as well. And, and unfortunately, we do not know it very well. We are lucky to have these documents about. In fact, the, the, the Longobard reality would that that was pretty active in this sense, so we can understand something, but the Longobards were simply recognizing that, okay, if you want to use that uh, system, you can, right? Because after all, that doesn't change who you are, right? It's just that contractually speaking, can be convenient for you, and we accept it, okay? And he specified, too, that the contractors could, in Latin, subdescendere de legge sua, which means they could, in this sense, not respect their own law, accepting that the contract was disciplined by the right of either another part, or simply even two Longobards could do it, uh, as we've said. Also, the chapter 127 prescribes that Longbird woman, after uh, a matrimony with, with a Roman, assumed the personal law of the latter. This is also interesting. Because who is uh, like, uh, which, which shows, of course, the preeminence also of, of the patriarchal society. Anyway, on the other side, and so that's the, the 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 not to create complications for for these mostly inheritance, presum presumably, but also other aspects. They yeah, you know, the longer bird woman wears a, a Roman becomes Roman herself. So they all deal with that in their own family, their own their own law. Um, and the there was also Roman law that, in virtue of Chapter 153, was acquired by by a Longobard uh, once he had become a clergyman, because the the church uh, discipline that was properly a like a Longobard church in the uh, in the right. Oh, they were Catholic, right? So. They were, yeah, I mean, it was somewhat different, you know, and had its own importance, for example, Aquilaia too, even Ravenna, in a way, you know, there, were, there was some diversity, but the point is that the, the church, the church's law was Roman law, even in their modified and uh, in, in their own way, but still enough for making a long bird uh, that wanted to become a clergyman a Roman, in the case. Also, the influence of Roman law is clear in other customs relative to prescription, um, to the tutelage of the minors on Lien, uh, and so on. The influence of the church, as you understand, was, was important in here as well. First of all, in disciplining matrimony. So, in the uh, old Longbar tradition, the woman passed from the father's mundum, or the one of the brother of the son, to the husband's mood, right? Uh, which made her almost a uh, object, uh, you know, um, a, a res, right? A thing, right? As an object of uh, transfer. This is the great, uh, you know, freedom that Germanic women allegedly had. They, they had a very few, and, sh and, and way less than in the, the Roman ones, and more generally, this of uh, this specific. Mediterranean contexts, um, and she didn't even express her, her own will, right? A condition, as we were saying before, that didn't um, couldn't be accepted by the church that preached the sacrality of matrimony. So, the traditional ceremony was enriched by um, a further formal act. It was the subarratio cum annulo in Latin, in which the woman found the space to express her own consent. To the matrimony, accepting the ring, which is not a big deal, right? Because it was just a very formal thing. Uh, many women, of course, were imposed to marry in this way. Uh, the the ring naturally symbolized the conjugal fealty. Also, the church obtained the full tutelage of the children born from a, a legitimate matrimony, right? The chapters 32, 33, and 34 by Lutprand excluded from the fatherly succession the uh, sons born out of the matrimony. And again, the church managed to infringe the monopoly of, of legitimate succession obtaining with uh, 
Lutprand 6 that uh, the dispositions of the last will were uh, to, to be legitimized with the condition that it could be pro anima, that is to say that, that they were donations for, for the church fundamentally. But we see from the contractual practice that the, for example, women, in fact, as we were saying before, were also granted for their lifetime uh, some, uh, I don't know, a man made testament said, you know, no, I want my daughter to enjoy this, uh, to, this plot of land until she dies. Even if the property is not hers, but she can't use it. Well, this thing was recognized. Right, and the interesting thing is that it doesn't find even formal sanctioning to it, in a way, so that the authorities were, were really fine with this, and this shows a great principle of discretionality that proves the, the flexibility of the system, and how, after all, you know, this was a way more autonomous reality, even for women, for the, the juridically disadvantaged, in this sense. Um, other customs appro uh, approved under Lutbrand disposed wide um, recognitions to the privileges of, of the clergy. They expressed the commitment to fight pagan practices that were, as you can imagine, still spread in the community. The um, broader uh, s system of Longbird customs was completed um, to by the usages approved by popular assemblies and put in written form by Ratkes and Eistulf that before Desiderius are the last, um, in fact, the last Longbird kings. And um, th this is interesting because it shows really, after all, a positive, uh, a very positive. As you really understand here, we, we have the passage from a much harsher reality, something very, mostly violent and brutal, right, at, into a truly civil and, you know, more intelligent one under the same Longbird law, right? So this is not to be weaponized I in any way, which is a pretty big punch in the face to everybody who thinks that, you know, uh, in the original Germanic reality, women were freer, uh, society was uh, more more just, uh, and that this terrible uh, Christians were so oppressive, right? Th these are all ideas that I discovered randomly uh, that a huge chunk of today's Western population believes in uh, without any, and I, s I stress any, historical base, but just wishful thinking because that makes them feel better, mostly also for reasons that are very ugly, that are mostly, uh, you know, um, also not just, it's not just a matter of religion, it's simply trying hopelessly to stress that, that there was a civilization where there wasn't and not accepting what is actually much more beautiful, historically speaking, that there is a growth from living together and from sorting out problems and improving your living conditions, right? So I don't really understand these uh, ideologies. I don't understand what, um, how can, and the Longobert example is so crystalline because the beauty of it, it is still Germanic, but it's most obviously influenced by the, 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 the Roman and ecclesiastical juridical practice, and it proves exactly the, improv the improvement through this, this influence of an otherwise brutal reality, right? Or at least much more primitive, that was surely functional for the worlds that we live in. It's not that in the North people were evil, or, you know, these were a bunch of, uh, you know, bloodthirsty barbarians that couldn't handle civilization. They lived in a different context, and it's silly to put in parallel different realities uh, and pretend to force them uh, up to the point of even inverting the, you know, the evidence to, to, to prove your own delusions. This is wrong and sad, and um, but there are people who do it. So my hope is also by making this video is that, you know, at least the, the clever will understand and hopefully also teaching it to others, because this is, I repeat it, no invention of mine. This is written by, th this is what we study in Western academies now, people who study them. Unfortunately, I know, academies are detaching themselves from, from, from the masses, in a way, because 
even the value of education now has become ridiculous, uh, especially in the most, uh, you know, in the places that are, that do not even see what education means anymore, because the, the difference is if you just can spend your life glued to a smartphone and doing nothing else but, you know, chewing popcorns in front of Netflix, well, I can tell you that that is not where further civilization will emerge. F further civilization will emerge from those realities that are trying to make a difference. The other ones already at the moral level, so at the most important one, are done for in many ways. But uh, it's even normal, right? Who has too much doesn't uh, doesn't know what to do with it, uh, it, doesn't know how to earn it anymore. The balance should be always kept. So I, I will conclude rapidly on the Carolingian phase of the story because we will probably deal with it on another video, both properly from a historical point of view, but also from a um, a juridical point of view. So in 774, as you know, the Longobard Kingdom uh, didn't end, uh, but was conquered by Charlemagne, that defeated the Zibarius. So to make it very, very simple, the Longobard dominion in Italy limited at, at this point to the Duchy of Spoleto, the Duchy of Benevent, and the kingdom passed, in fact, to the Franks, uh, in indicated as actually as Regnum Langobardorum, but also Regnum Italicum, right? So we talk about the Italic kingdom for for this reality, central northern Italy today, basically. And Charlemagne, as you understand, was reigned over various peoples that were settled uh, in this huge area of Europe, and as it's uh, very famous on. Uh, Christmas of 800 was crowned emperor of what become eventually known as the Holy Roman Empire, which is technically what begins in here. I, I, I really don't understand people who believe that the Holy Roman Empire was refounded by Otto the first because it's like it's pure historiographical invention. This, this was the same thing all along, right? There was never any minimal distinction in this regard. And by the way, at the time was not not at the time Otto the First was known as Holy Roman Empire, um, but um, by Leo the Third in Saint Peter's and Basilica. And and the, the thing is that during Charlemagne's uh, reign, uh, there were many Franks, especially from today's uh, Picardy, Belgium. That's that were, by the way, the, the most important areas of the Frankish, of Francia proper, that were settled specifically in Italy because they were the most important noblemen and they were sent there exactly to exercise a, a, a steady control, exactly because they, they, the, the land was the most important of the whole empires we've seen. Um, and uh, and these people were naturally, of, uh, so they came with the nobility, their retinues, even some communities, so they, they settled eventually in Italy. So these came from other Germanic nationes, as they were known in, in Latin. So they were different people, they were mostly Franks. Um, also, the, the Frankish kingdom itself had become a, you know, there were many influences, but juridically, uh, this is the, the true ethnic discriminant, they were Franks. By establishing in the Italic kingdom, as it's um, witnessed by the uh, in Increase in uh, professiones legales, so literally the declarations pronounced by the contractors of a juridical, um, in fact, of a, of a contract proper to indicate their their personal law mm, become more important. Uh, there was even a moment in which technically an Italian subject could um, simply even change its own. Uh, its own juridical identity. Like they could change and say, okay, I, I don't want to be a Longobard anymore, I want to be either a Roman, I want to be a, a Frank, right? This was important at some levels. The Carolingians naturally tried to, to, to homogenize this picture because the plurality of juridical profession was uh, always there, was never cancelled. But it's obvious that if a kingdom has to work unitarily, you know, th these groups have to, to, to coexist in a way. Uh, think even about, I don't know, think about Rome, that 
technically it's not incorporated in the kingdom, but it was a very multicultural place. There were Anglo-Saxons, there were people coming from, from, from many places, right? So um, the point here is, first of all, in our reality, that um, before the Frankish conquest was now homogeneously long compared in some ways. You know, we've seen there were some Romans, but, you know, the idea of being a Longobard now acquires almost um, even a geographical nature. You know, the Italy was known as uh, Langobardia uh, from every everywhere. The Franks, the Vikings, the Arabs all call it this way because it was obvious. And this this is a testament actually to the to the homo the, the cultural homogenization after all that the Longobards properly gave to Italy. Like, if, if the Longobards, if are, if anything, the, the, the f true first um, creators of a proto, you know, Italian identity proper. Like, the, that, that's where the concept of Italy begins to be, not just an administrative repartition, of properly a place where people, after all, had their own. And, and the law was fundamental into this. Right? That there is an enormous legacy in the land of the Longobard um, juridical system. Um, the, mm, the, there was natural an influence between these various uh, professions, as you understand. The, the Frankish element, for example, uh, entered to be part of the broader Longobard system. Or the, the, the were specific, uh, also because the, the, the were a bit heterogeneous laws. As we were saying before, the, the, the Franks mostly issued these capitularies that were other... It's as if they had been other additions to the Longobard laws. Right, so they continued the list in a way. It's just they weren't properly part of that anymore. They were f they were not part of the edict. They were part of now the Frankish capitularies. But as we've seen in the videos on the origins of the revival of Roman law, this stuff was all basically packed together in the juridical practice. So they took everything they, they could. Also because this favored the flexibility of the law. That is to say, if I, you know, find an advantageous um, prescription, a negotiable form that is disciplined by this law, well, you know, I have an option more to use it. So it may seem complicated, but actually it developed in a very good uh, uh hybrid and synthesis we could say it was we know it was properly used uh, and functioned in that society um, so the, among the capitularies the capitularia uh, we can distinguish the uh, two types the capitularia legibus addenda they were approved by the assemblies of a single nation let's say um, that defined the norms that were added to the ones previously, uh, you know, um, you know, previously used by that specific people. So that is to say, if the Longobards wanted to continue their own law, they could do it, even adding other uh, other stuff in this regard uh, through the Frankish legislation. Or the Capitularia per se scribenda. Then instead. And they are somewhat more interesting because they are, they, they were capitularies issued by communities that resided in the same territory, independently from whether they were juridically Frankish, Longobard. And this is most obvious because they lived in the same place. So whichever Nazi they were, they were the same community, right? And this is, in fact, also the long path through which such... Uh, these juridical systems are integrated, in a way. Um, and these um, capitularia of both types, will of the that were enforced in the or were used, however, more flexibly in the Italic kingdom, were eventually collected together, and will form the capitulare italicum. That will be um, properly what eventually will add itself to the feudal laws to other laws that would be issued later and there would be at the base in fact as we were saying of that properly italic juridical tradition from which the bolognese school eventually will start um, to recover roman law through other channels all right long video but i think it was important to to make it because it tells uh, i think a bit 
of what we really wanted to to, to say um, to introduce also in further videos in the future because uh, I I presume it's um, as we were saying pretty pretty overlooked topic but also of dramatic importance for early medieval history as a whole for the impact that these dynamics will have in in in, in the rest of Europe also eventually for now however we stop it here I hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time